Australia for the birds today. Uh, here are some rainbow lorikeets having a good time in uh, a similarly colorful tree. Uh, here's a pair of them with uh, a plumage that's not maybe in quite as uh, pristine a condition. Uh, one of the kind of most uh, dinosaur-like birds you will ever see is the giant cassowary. Um, these have this like giant uh, bone on their head and they're just absolutely massive and they, they do uh, hurt and even kill people with these giant claws. Uh, you do not want to get close to these birds, they're, they're not your friends. So, uh, a few things to mention uh, up front uh, from, from questions that have come up. Uh, so, one is uh, as you're debugging lab zero, we want to add print statements. Uh, we're going to do that with print F and C and a couple notes about that. Uh, in C, strings have to, be, have to use double quotes. Uh, single strings are pairs, and the compiler won't like you can put more than one character between single quotes. The single quotes means one character, like one, like one by an integer. So printf Uh, might look something like this, where first you give it a string, s equals, and then we have a percent followed by some letter, which is like we're going to fill in this percent thing with some additional argument, percent s is for a string, and so this s here would need to be a R star, a pointer to the first character in an array of characters. That's what our string is. And then this backslash n is a new line. Printf does not add in a new line by default. So if you want uh, something you print to have a new line after it, you would add that in yourself. Other uh, format specifiers that we commonly use percent D for an integer or um, rather for an integer percent LD for long and percent P for a pointer if you want to print out the literal memory address that the pointer is. Yeah. And this is just convention, like these to be in the record. Do we have to use percentage P, percentage D, percentage uh, This is how printf works. So if you want to print an integer, you have to use percentage. Okay. okay. Yeah. Remember, like the, the name is following the percentage. Is that convention or is that how you have to do it? Uh, you're talking about like pointer or int? Like, does D always have to be an int? Percentage yes, D? percent D is. Fill in this with an integer. Okay, okay. Thanks. That's what percent D means. Yes? Um, is there a debugging? Is there a way to get GDB or Valorant to work on the Mantis server? Uh, both of those should work on the Mantis server. Yes? Where does the D come from like, for ins and longs? Like, why, why is it a D? Uh, that I would have to, I would have to look up. Uh, percent I, I believe, also is an integer, which makes sense. I'm sure there's some historical reason why it's percent D, uh, but not one that I'm familiar with. Other questions about printf? Uh, another thing about uh, the lab. Uh, last class, I went through uh, a number of different versions of a function I call qadd. The final version that I got to is most of the code for Q insert head, inserting a new, a new node in the head. Uh, the things that Q add did not do uh, 
So you will need to do in the lab is check if my output returns null. We want to, to write code that's robust to different failure states. One of those is we're out of memory, in which case malloc returns null. Uh, and in a lab, we will add a tail field to the queue so that you can, in constant time, uh, update the tail as well. And when adding a new node to an empty list, that new node is now both the head and the tail. And so in that case, insert head also needs to update the tail, and QAD did not do that. But otherwise, in terms of how to use malloc, uh, how to malloc uh, memory for the string and copy it over, you can refer to that, that code. Uh, lastly, there have been uh, some issues uh, connecting to Mantis. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, working on getting those uh, resolved, please uh, keep letting me know any problems you run into. Uh, there are alternatives to working on Mantis. Um, uh, several of those are described on the course webpage. Uh, under programming environments here. So there's both um, uh, using a, a virtual machine or uh, if you're on Windows, using the, the Windows subsystem for Linux are, are both uh, potential options. And for this and some of the other labs, uh, they will work on, um, on Macs as well. Uh, minus uh, debugging using GDB, which I've had a lot of trouble getting. There are Mac security features that make that really annoying to, to get set up. Um, all right, any other questions to get us started? All right, let's do a bit of review for which we will use the bar. How many bytes would it take to represent the string strange love in C? One of my favorite films. Uh, we're mostly thinking 12, but maybe one of these others. Go ahead and take a minute to talk to your neighbors about it. And we're all on board with that. This is going to take 12 bytes, one for each of those 11 letters and a 12 for a null terminator. Uh, any questions about this? Just making sure, like the grade of this code is very important in the 10% of the existing grade. Uh, these are entirely ungraded. <laughs> <laughs> this is just practice. Yes. Yeah. So I see why this one would be 12, but like in, in general, when, we're, um, when we do the table, like the type and the size, why are we saying that um, like, like a character is, actually never mind, I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I know where you're going with that. Um, so just to uh, clarify, this question is trying to how many bytes does the array of characters take up? Whenever a program has a variable that's a string, it's going to be the memory address of the first character, a car star. And so that's not what this was referring to. That would always be eight bytes. Other questions? All right. Which of these four would you use as the definition of a struct for a two-dimensional point? I got a point that has uh, two coordinates. I guess all of these should have a semicolon after the closing curly brace. So imagine that's there. <laughs> So B and C are the, the popular ones. Uh, go ahead and discuss with your neighbors uh, how you think you would define uh, such a struct. All right, so we're basically split on B and C. So 
Does someone want to, to make uh, a case for answer B? Yes? I heard just defining the structure would need to put pointers at X and Y put X and Y. Yeah, so that's that I think is a, a, a good case that our answer B is like our struct's going to be uh, a box with X and Y in it, and so if our point is like the point 10, 2, 10 and 2 are inside our struct, the integers themselves. Okay. And then if I were to create a second point with that, um create a new x and y with, with it not being pointers. And what would happen if they were pointers? So our version C says, again, it has an x and y in it, but here these are pointers to it stored somewhere else in memory. And so this here would be 16 bytes uh, of worth of pointers, um, assuming we're on a 64-bit system, and then still our, our eight bytes worth of ints. Our version B is just eight bytes worth of ints. Um, so even though they both work, when it comes to memory efficiency, you would want to choose B over C? Uh, yes, yeah, so basically, you would need a good reason to want to make these pointers. Um, typical reasons that we make things pointers are we don't know how big, how much space we need ahead of time. So, for example, we have a string. We don't know how many characters are going to be in the particular string uh, that we want while the program is running. And so we just have a pointer to somewhere in memory where we're going to put that string, and at the time that we need it, we use malloc, we allocate enough space for that string. Or, um, or if we have, um, like our, our linked list, we have our, our multiple nodes, um, the, we're not going to be able to, if we have any, say, a recursive structure like that, we couldn't have like one of this, uh, this the box that the struct contains as one of its field another struct, because that is going to nest potentially infinitely. The compiler doesn't know how much space that's going to take if we kind of directly nest them in one another, so that's another case where we need to have these all in separate places in memory and use pointers. But when we have something that we know the size of, ints are always four bytes, we typically would not need to, to have them be pointers. What are your questions on this? All right. So let's talk about uh, memory layout. <coughs> This is something that we will come back to, so this is not the, the full story, but it's, it's enough uh, for now. Recall that we had memory is this long array of bytes with kind of some, uh, uh, each byte having a unique address, ranging from low addresses to, to high addresses. And uh, we actually have this kind of uh, whole range of memory, our, our address space is separated into different regions. So I've mentioned a couple of these regions uh, already. So the first is the stack, and uh, 
We can ask what goes in a particular region. And who is responsible for kind of managing or setting up the memory uh, and values that are in that region? So in the case of the stack, what is here is local variables. And kind of we de declare a local variable inside a function that's going to go into this uh, region of, uh, that is the stack. And information that we need to make procedure or, or function calls work. That also lives on the stack, and we're going to spend uh, a couple lectures on that in, in a few weeks. But uh, kind of other information context that is part of uh, making function calls work, that goes on the stack. Uh, who is responsible for it? Um, It's the compiler slash the assembly code that the compiler generates, and it is and from our perspective as programmers, it is done automatically. Like we are never having specific lines of C code to directly manage what is on the stack. Like when we declare a local variable or make a function call, that affects what's on the stack, uh, but that happens automatically. Uh, and the other thing to note about the stack is that it lives at high addresses. Right, we have low addresses down here and high addresses down here. The stack is in this kind of range of high addresses in memory. And when we need more space on the stack, we this region kind of grows down. It moves into lower and lower addresses. Yeah. When, you, when you say higher addresses, do you mean like more memory? Uh, I mean, the, the literal number that is the address is high. So like down at the bottom here, we have address zero. Up at the top here, we have the address that's all Fs uh, and hex, so kind of the maximum number we can we can make out of the memory address. So that's what I mean by high versus low. It's just like, like the index. Yeah, it's like a high index in our array of bytes versus the low index. Yeah. So the stack kind of like, if you add a single new value, it kind of gets like upside down, almost like it, it gets added to the bottom. Okay. Yes, yes. So, so we are we, we will think of pushing things and popping things off, uh, onto and off of the stack, and that's going to be it is going to be upside down because the when we push something on, it's at kind of the lowest address of the stack since the kind of the well, Talk about this more, but the, the top of the stack is kind of where this line is, which is the lowest address of the, the region. Other questions? So, our next region is the key. Uh, what goes here is Memory that we ask for via malloc. So anytime we call malloc, uh, we give it a number, uh, a specific number of bytes that we want, and we get back a pointer to that chunk of bytes somewhere in this region called the heap. And unlike our stack, which is managed automatically, We would say that the heap is managed dynamically, which just means like while the program is running, we are kind of malloking at different points in time, things on the heap. And in particular, in contrast to the stack, it is manual. So when we want memory on the heap, the program calls the specific function, calls malloc to get it. When we're done with that memory, uh, we call the function free to say, okay, we're, we're done with this memory, someone else can use it. The last uh, region here 
I will call static for now. There's actually some different kinds of things. Uh, in, in a future lecture, I will separate this static region into different parts. But for now, this is global variables string literals, so anything uh, we see in double quotes, uh, and program code also will live in this region. Uh, and I'm calling it static because of the stack and the heap, uh, which can uh, grow and shrink in size. Um, so like the stack can grow down, the heap will grow, will grow up. We need more space. The static region, the compiler uh, sets up the, uh, the instructions to create it, and then when the program starts, everything that's going to be in the static region is there, and, it, uh, and it's there for the whole time the program is Yes. Yeah. 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 String literals have is that different from like Yeah, I guess string literals can be different that. Yeah, so string string literal is anything that appears in double quotes explicitly in the program. So, uh, if your code has some, has some string and double quotes in it, at compile time, the compiler knows, oh, I need to make this string hello exist somewhere in memory. And we know that it can just exist for the whole life of the program and can be used when needed. And so it will set aside space in this static area for that string. Yeah. If you use the string hello in multiple spots in your code, like there, there is here and somewhere else that you can get it somewhere, does it make only one string literal hello or does it make Yeah, so that, that's, that's a, uh, a good question. Uh, one of the advantages to kind of knowing ahead of time when we need the string set hello and setting it up is that we only need to we only need one instance of it and can use that. What other questions do you have? So if I was to write in my code like b equals hello, then is the b equals a pointer that's stored in the stack, and then the pointer points to the static memory? That's exactly right. That, uh, b equals hello. b would be a local variable holding a memory address stored in the stack. And this array of six characters, these five plus an L terminator, would be in the static region. And B would be storing a memory address of wherever that, that array of characters was. Yes? Yeah. What happens if you do that and then you do and then you try to modify what's stored on B? Um, so here the compiler's gonna have to do some extra work. Uh, if it sees that it's been modified, well then it can't do just one copy if hello is used somewhere else. So yeah, the, the um, C compiler is, is a kind of large complex program that's analyzing the code in all sorts of ways in order, in order to set it. So you, yes, you could, uh, you could modify it and uh, uh, the compiler might need to, to adjust for that. Yes? So if I had a letter like C equals hello, that C pointer point the same hello literal in the static memory? Yes. And unless there was uh, the chance that it would be modified, and then, uh, then I think two, two copies would be created. Other questions? Yes. Can I start with you? Can you modify it? Like, I said B equals hello, I'd be like B5 equals A. Will um, I copy over to the stack? Or will I, like, 
in the sour cheese that we're looking at? Uh, so yeah, I, depending on the kind of data, it, either it can be modified or, or it can't. Um, uh, in this case, I think that you would be able to, to modify that. That would be to be rules like L or I. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so, different kinds of static data can be modified and other kinds can't. For example, a program can't modify its own code, um, but a program can modify global variables. Um, I haven't looked into precisely what happens if you start modifying uh, static strings, um, but I could write some, uh, could do some tests to figure out, okay, where, what is the compiler exactly going to do with this? Well, you'd be able to, if you wanted to, right? You just find the memory address up below within the static and then just overwrite it with something? Yes, unless the system is not allowing that part of memory to be written to, okay. which is the case with, the, with program code, for yeah. example. This is, it isn't something you'd want to do, likely. Um, well, the world is filled with all sorts of nefarious people, so... Um, uh, the, the C compiler has to not consider just what like reasonable, reasonable people would want to do, um, but literally anything anyone might do by mistake or bad intent. Okay. All right, so... With that discussion, uh, I want to talk a little more about uh, malloc and free. So, as we've seen, malloc takes a number of bytes uh, when we call it, and It will then return a pointer to some chunk of memory uh, that's that many bytes on it. And when I said that the, the memory management has to be manual, this also means that when we are done with uh, some chunk of memory on the heap, we want to free it, and we have to give to free. Exactly the pointer that was returned by some previous call to map. And so this gives us the kind of rule that we want to follow. Every call to malloc that we make needs some eventual matching call to free on exactly the same pointer that Matt. Yeah, Pat. Does free do anything other than say compiler that goes with how to uh, reallocate that memory or something? Maybe free something and then access it again? Anyhow, anything to those two steps? Would this be able to act as something that you just free? That is an excellent question. What does free do exactly? You will implement free in lab four. So you you will learn uh, at a great level of detail exactly what free is doing. Um, the short answer is free makes it available for other programs. So maybe someone else has started using it and then accessing it or changing it will, will cause sadness. Uh, but free may also, once you say it's free, the code that's actually managing the heap may do things to help you keep track of what's going on in the heap. And so then doing stuff can, can still cause problems even if uh, someone else is using it. Yeah. If malloc isn't able to allocate the correct number of bytes or whatever, does it return a pointer to a null or does it return a null? Uh, it returns a pointer with the value zero. Sorry, a pointer to the memory address zero, which we also call null. Uh, the memory address zero is never legal to access, so dereferencing memory address zero will always cause the program to crash. Yeah. So just to emphasize, what the thing you're putting in free is 
like the pointer, it's not the item stored in the address. So for the linked list, for example, you don't want the node itself on the pointer referring to the node? Yes, you want to pass in the memory address that Malik returned. Okay, thank you. So you would call free on, say, Q arrow head, because that's the address of the first node in the list, or call free on the next field of a node, because that's the address of the, of the next node. Great. Yeah. You, I mean, I guess I, I know I've tried to free stuff that had not put in that but if you like ignore the error that pops up, could you free some random memory that had maybe something there? So the answer to that depends on like the precise details of what free does. Uh, you can give free an address, and it will go try and do the things that it's supposed to do. Assume it, and it will just assume that address is on the heap and, and was one that was previously returned by memory. And it will just, you know, go ahead and, and do that, um, and the behavior is undefined. Maybe uh, nothing will happen, maybe if you're lucky, it will crash, uh, or maybe it will just, like, do something weird that you only find out, like, if it happens to cause a problem later. Yes? Can you free an array just by giving the memory address of its first item? Because don't you not know how long the array is? So you can free any pointer that was returned by malloc. So if you malloc uh, like uh, 200 bytes for an array, if you give free that pointer, the system is keeping track, oh, this pointer is associated with a block of, of 200 bytes. Yeah. Um, so it's your malloc is doing a lot of time. How does it avoid like wasting memory by just ending up with a lot of small pointers? That's a great question. I will ask you to wait until week six or seven, because we will we will look in detail at, at how that works. But yeah, that is that is something we have to be concerned about when, when implementing that. Other questions? All right. So I'd like to do uh, an activity to practice how we're thinking about memory management and C. So here is some code. Um, is that big enough to, to read in the back? All right, so uh, this code has four compiler errors. And once uh, the code, once those compiler errors, uh, in addition to those compiler errors, there are two potential runtime errors. So bugs that uh, uh, the compiler uh, doesn't doesn't catch, um, and that might crash the program or might have have no effect, which is always the joy of of working in C. So I'd like you to to work with your neighbors uh, to figure out how you would fix. Uh, each of these four errors, and if you can identify uh, the two the two runtime errors. So, everyone have a, a thought to volunteer on on what's going on in this first uh, Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we know that underscore t isn't a number, and malloc needs a number of bytes and. Uh, I have a question on this one. Yes. So would we want star root equal to, um, so is the only issue there what's inside malloc? That's right. Okay. So um, if I remove, so if I did node t root equals malloc size of node t, would that be the same thing? Basically the malloc is going to return a pointer. Mm -hmm. And then you're, do you run, well, what is the parentheses node t star doing? Yes, so this uh, parentheses node t star of malloc is a type cast. So this is a this is a I guess a, uh, mostly a stylistic. So the return type of malloc, I said it returns a pointer to some, some block on the heap. Its type 
is void star, which is this generic pointer type in C. It's a pointer to something that we, we don't uh, something that we don't know about. So when we call malloc, it doesn't know what the size of the thing it's malloc is, it's just handing back a chunk of memory. And so it hands back this generic pointer, a memory address, but without the additional information of what kind of thing is it uh, is stored there. And so by cast, we're, we're, we're telling uh, the code, all right, change it from a void star into a node T star. So giving it the extra information about the type of thing it's pointing to. And uh, this can catch some bugs because this void star will be automatically converted into any type of pointer. So any variable set equal to malloc, as long as that variable is a, a type of pointer, it will be automatically changed into the corresponding type. But by putting this type text here, we're making the right-hand side of the equals have this particular type, which means if I had a bug and the variable I'm assigning to is a different type of pointer, the compiler will warn me. So this cast is a way to catch a certain kind of bug. So it's not a, it's not necessary, but um, not a bad idea. So if um, we have no t star root, the star is dereferencing, so it's saying the thing that root is pointing to is a pointer, because malloc returns a pointer. Yeah. So on, on the the left hand side, we have. node t star root, and this node t star is the type of the variable root. So this is not a dereference, it's saying that the type uh, of root is a pointer to a node t. Thank you. And like whether you put the space before the star or after the star is just stop. So you'll see C code where uh, it, it's either way. Other questions on this this first one? All right. How about this next one? We have an error that it's we it's saying we can't use equals equals between a, a struct and a, a void star, which null has has type void star. Yes. Uh, isn't the problem that we're dereferencing root with the star part of it, so we're comparing like a value to a pointer rather than comparing a pointer? Pointer. Exactly. The, the thing that we root is our pointer, and we want to check is that pointer null? Like, did malloc give us back null? If root is null and we dereference null, program will crash with a segmentation fault. So, what we would want is root equals equals null, because we want to compare the memory address, the pointer, to, to null. Does that make sense? Yes. Is null always a pointer? Null is, we use null instead of just a zero because it's a zero that has a, a pointer type. So we'll get okay. compiler warnings like this. Okay. Um, yes? How would we indicate like a null value for a non-pointer? Like is there a null like value indicator or like, is that just a zero or? Uh, so, is there such a thing as a, as a null integer? Not, not really. Um, like integers can be like any any number. Um, so for like null makes sense in the context of like a memory address, but not really the other sorts of data that we're working with. Other questions? All right. How about these next two here? We have the same compiler error on both about an incompatible type when assigning. Yeah, so the arrow is dereferencing, and so you're dereferencing the uh, pointer twice, so you want to remove the star in front of root, so you're taking the pointer, the hook back arrow, dereferencing, and then getting the left. Yeah, that's, that's right. That these stars are the issue. We want to get rid of them. Um, this arrow has higher precedence. It will happen before the star. So the star was dereferencing like this left and, and, and right pointer. And yeah, we want to assign the pointer to null, not 
dereference the pointer and, and put it on it. Yes? Yeah, so this, uh, this arrow is short for star root dot right, is that, is that yeah, what we're referring to? Yeah, so we could replace this, this outside star would, would still be extraneous, but we could change this dash greater than into the reference and then, and then dot. Question? No? Okay. Uh, how about uh, potential runtime errors? We've made these changes, the compiler is happy. Uh, uh, what's going on? Lisa? Uh, that's that's exactly right. That we never want to access memory that's already been freed. So if we free root first, we shouldn't then try and dereference that pointer to get the value. So you kind of want to, if you have pointers inside of structs, you sort of need to free them from the inside out. Free the value and then the struct as a whole. Yeah. Is the amount or the size of the character? I mean, I think it would work in this case because we would use only seven, right? So it's a, uh, we do have an issue on this malloc with how many bytes we're, we're telling it to, to malloc. So how many bytes does a, a char take up? Yeah. One. Takes up one byte. So size of char is going to give us back one. Malloc's going to give us back a pointer to a single byte on a heap. And stir copy says, OK, take whatever is in S, however many bytes are in that string, and write them over to to the, the destination. So we're going to write past the end of the one byte thing we asked for on the heap. Maybe it will be fine. Maybe disaster will ensue. But that's why it's it's a potential runtime error, at least, that we, we did not malloc enough space for our string. Yes? Um, with the whole idea of it working or causing disaster, is that at least consistent or no? You mean if you run the program multiple times, so it always do the same thing? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Because <laughs> it just depends on how memory is being used. You know, maybe you overwrite something that doesn't matter one time and then another time you would. Yes. So is it is it like the sometimes or sometimes it's disaster almost like worse than a consistent error? Oh, absolutely. It's much much worse. Uh, a bug that you can't reliably reproduce is like the ultimate nightmare. Uh, where, all right, uh, we have a bug that occurs one out of every 2,000 times we run the program. Um, but we want to deploy this software to a million users. So one out of 2,000 times means we have like catastrophic failure for a large number of users. Um, yeah, so uh, these are sometimes called Heisen bugs, right? Sometimes they're, they're there, sometimes they're not. And yes, um, this is why there's, both research on like being able to prove code correct, like you can uh, sort of like a mathematical proof, like you can analyze code and prove certain properties of it. So that's kind of one that's being applied to like software that it's critical not to have have bugs in it, or using uh, more modern languages like Rust that force the programmer to be much more explicit and careful about, about memory. Yeah? All right, so how would you fix that error? Like, with the, with the other runtime error, I think you can just flip the line to mm -hmm. the network. In this case, what would you do? Yeah, so if we want to malloc a number of bytes equal to the, the length of the, the string that we're, we're copying over, uh, any suggestions on, on how we would do that? Yes? How would you malloc strn length of S plus one. So are you going to say so? Yeah. Yeah, what is, 
going on here? Why do we want Sterling at S plus one? Oh, because uh, we didn't know. We didn't know that. And Sterling Ster yeah. takes in a pointer? Yeah, Sterling takes in a, a char star, a pointer of a string. It gives us back the number of, of characters in that string. It does not count the null terminator. So, yeah, so that's, that's where our plus one is from. And in star copy, it's root arrow value, which and value is a pointer. So then star copy is also taking in a pointer. Um, okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, star copy takes in a pointer to the destination and then a pointer to the, the source, and it just copies from one to the other. Um, and stir copy will copy over as many characters as are in the source. There is a safer version, stir n copy, which you give a third parameter that's a number of things to, to copy, a maximum number of characters to copy over, which avoids potentially like overriding stuff at the, at the destination. Anyway. In this situation, stir copy doesn't copy the null terminator, right? Even once you change the network stuff, people are like, oh. Um, stir copy will copy over the null terminator. It will, it will read the source string until it gets to a null terminator and copy over all those characters. Yes? Is there like a, like a shorthand or like an easy way to remember the plus one for sterling with use in malloc, or you just kind of have to remember about the null terminator and you know, not forget it? Uh, we just kind of have to remember um, <laughs> that. Uh, Yes, that, that we are programming in C and life is hard. <laughs> Other questions? All right, so only, only nine minutes left. So uh, we'll just get, um, uh, get into uh, the beginning of our kind of next topic in the class, which is uh, how do we represent integers in memory? So uh, first day of class, I showed you this uh, bit of Java where I multiplied 200 by 300 by 400 by 500, and I got negative 884 million. So that was weird, and now we're going to figure out exactly why that happened. So a bit of preface, why would we study integer representation? This is like a low level detail that uh, perhaps you've never had to think about in, in any uh, uh, computer science that you've done so far. So there, there are two main reasons why we would care about this. Uh, the first is, goes to sort of the, the, the philosophy of being a, a Carleton student and being a Carleton CS major, which is we want to look inside things and understand how they work. We want to, to take these, these mysterious black boxes and unpack them, um, and we don't want to just be satisfied with kind of waving our hand and saying, you know, it's, it's done somehow, who cares? Um, and this is also a great example of a general principle in computer science, where we have some number of bits, and we have some values that we want to represent, and we need to define a system, a set of rules, or what's often called an encoding that says that defines how certain patterns of, of ones and zeros relate to the values that we care about. The other reason is that Messing this up can have serious consequences. So in 1996, a European Space Agency rocket exploded. Uh, it was very expensive because the software on the rocket crashed when it converted a 64-bit floating point number to a 16-bit integer. And the floating point value was, didn't fit in the 16 bits, and the rocket exploded. So keeping in mind how numbers are represented, uh, as important, it was also fortunate this did not result in a disaster, but in 2015, it was found that Boeing 787s contained a software flaw where they had some counter that would just be counting up over time. And if this counter went long enough without being reset, it might, cause, it might result in integer overflow and cause loss of control of the airplane. <laughs> And so, again, being aware of like how numbers are represented can be very important in, uh, 
in these kind of situations. So, one uh, idea that, that we're going to start out with is the idea of bit weight. That if we have the, the four bit binary number 0101, each of these places has a, a, a certain weight or, or value. So we have, and this goes back to the discussion of, of binary in our, our first class, we had uh, the, the different twos, two to the zero, two to the first, two to the second. So that's just what I mean by, by a bit weight. When we're thinking about a binary number, we have two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three. So this would be two to the zero, one, plus two to the two, four, so this four bit number is, is five. And as we're talking about how we interpret some pattern of bits as an integer, this idea of each bit has some weight or value associated with its position within the binary number is, is going to be part of all of these arguments. Any questions on this uh, idea of bit weight? All right, so to start with the simpler case, we can talk about, about both signed and unsigned integers. Meaning, signed, we have positive and negative values, unsigned, only zero or positive. So, let's say we had three bits and we were representing unsigned integers. I could draw them kind of as a circle as follows. Zero, zero, zero. with three bits, and I can just use this idea of bit weight to say, okay, well, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So a few observations to make about this. I have drawn it in a circle because as we go around, we are adding 1 each time, and in particular, if we have just three bits and we add one to seven, this would give us a one followed by three zeros, but because we only have three bits for our number, the, X, the bit that carries over gets thrown out. And so we, we overflow that back around to zero as we keep adding. So that, that's one observation. The other is we had three bits, and that gave us two to the three, or eight different values that we can represent with three bits, and unsigned. Those values were 0 to 2 to the 3 minus 1. It was the kind of range of values that we could get with our unsigned integers. And if I go through and replace 3 with n, and now we have, if we have n bits to represent unsigned integers, we're going to have 2 to the n different integers, and those are going to be from 0 up to 2 to the n minus 1. And this 
uh, when we're thinking about, about overflow and kind of how many bytes or, or bits do we need to use to represent a number, we can take this and say, okay, if we have an unsigned four byte integer in C, it's zero up to two to the 32 minus one. If we use a long, that's 64 bits, so it's from zero up to two to the 64th minus one. So we're setting up this relationship between how many, how much memory we use and kind of what range of values we can represent. When we move to signed, uh, to signed numbers, uh, we're going to need to have some way of accounting for, for negative and positive, which is sort of bit weight that I uh, here doesn't do. So look forward to that. Uh, on Friday, um, I have office hours 4.30 to 5.30 today, and otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thank you.